a hablar hoy de dolor de cabeza eh, y dolor ocular para el oftalmólogo general. Yo presenté al doctor Pren la pasada vez, hice la introducción, pero para los que no están acá, él es profesor de oftalmología, los que no estaban en ese momento, él es profesor de oftalmología, neurología y neurocirugía, es profesor activo y cirujano también de órbita y de cráneo. Él es eh, vicepresidente, también es eh, jefe del Departamento de Oftalmología en la Facultad de Medicina en la Universidad de Colorado, en Denver. Y como todos sabemos, una de sus pasiones es el síndrome de hipertensión endocraniana, eh, terapias vestibulares y visuales y también oftalmopatía tiroidea. Thank you, Frank. Ok. So with us, pues, Thank eh, you. Okay. Uh -huh. Here. Okay. okay, let me turn off my video. And perfect. Entonces. Great. Okay. Fabulous. All right. So I'm very happy to be speaking to you today on headache for the ophthalmologist. And this. For some of you, it will be very basic. I'm happy to answer any more complicated questions, but what I really want to emphasize when I'm talking about headache for the ophthalmologist is going to be headache, when should I worry? What headache syndromes are dangerous for the ophthalmologist or dangerous for the patient and that the ophthalmologist needs to recognize and differentiate from headache, because headache is exceptionally common. So I have no financial disclosures. And so the idea is to identify that headache that should prompt an urgent evaluation to categorize to some degree the common types of headache to recognize the ophthalmic signs and symptoms of specific headache syndromes, and then to understand management strategies for different types of headache. So the typical patient who comes in with headache is perhaps a woman in her 20s or 30s, like this 34-year-old woman. She's had headache daily for four months. And in addition to having the headache, she reports blurred vision. She's not exactly sure what that means. She just says, that my vision's blurry when my head hurts. I cannot describe any specific scotoma, no missing vision, she has no flashes or floaters, and she doesn't feel that colors are washed out, nothing else with it. And her visual acuity is 20-20 in each eye at both distance and near. It's without correction, but she strains, especially at near. She has no RAPD, the visual fields to confrontation are full. She has normal extraocular movements, and her intraocular pressures are normal. So, in this particular instance, headache is very common, right? It's been estimated that uh, upwards of 25% of the population has regular headaches. If we look at migraine headache, it's been estimated 18 to 20% of the population, especially in women, will have migraine headache that satisfies the ICHD3 beta, the international classification of headache disorders, the most recent classification, they satisfy those criteria for migraine headache. And I will talk a little bit about the importance of recognizing the wide spectrum of migraine headache that can occur. Migraine headache is often the kind of headache that result that comes with aura, that comes with light and motion sensitivity, that gets better when the patient lies down in a dark room, um, may be associated with menses. These uh, characteristics of migraine headache are still true, but there are patients who experience migraine who will have only one or two of those characteristic findings. Now, what often brings patients with migraine headache to the attention of the ophthalmologist is the fact that they will have photopsias. And photopsias have been described in a number of different ways. And the photopsias of migraine headache, I think from the literature as well as my experience over the years, range well beyond the classic fortification spectrum that has been described as part of migraine aura. So we know that as ophthalmologists, we get these patients with migraine aura without headache. They will develop the colored or perhaps black and white flashes, often zigzag as shown here on this particular image. 
They often will block what the patient is looking at. They may start in a more compact manner in the center and then spread out more peripherally. And these patients, not surprisingly, come to the ophthalmologist first because they're not experiencing headache or even if they are experiencing headache, they are very disturbed by these photopsias that occur. And there's actually a, a wonderful book called Migraine Art, The Migraine Experience from Within that was put out of a collection of a description of migraine aura as drawn or painted by a number of very accomplished artists. And so I think as ophthalmologists, as neurologists, it's kind of a fascinating read to see how different people, and in particular, again, artists, have interpreted what their migraine aura looks like. And I think it's very illuminating, no pun intended, as a physician to see what patients put out there as a description of their disease. So you, you see one example there on the left where the photopsias seem to fill the entire visual field. They have these starburst sparks along with this uh, jagged so-called fortification spectra that that description derived from the appearance of medieval fortification walls around, around uh, towns and cities. And then you have a purely homonymous occurrence of this visual phenomenon in a different patient with migraine headache. And so patients will describe this. I've had patients come in with drawings. I'm sure many of you have as well. So when a patient like this comes in and whether or not they tell you that they are having headache in association with these photopsias, what are we to do? In addition to a complete eye exam, which of course we're going to do for every patient who walks in the door, um, are we going to do visual field testing? Is that indicated for every patient who has migraine or who has photopsias? I think if they, to me, if they are describing photopsias that are occurring in this very characteristic pattern and they are remitting within 20 to 30 minutes, maybe lasting as long as 60 minutes, I'm pretty confident that they are migraine, but I think that there is little downside to doing a visual field test in these patients. I personally will do automated perimetry in every patient who comes in with this type of photopsia, not just flashes, not just intermittent flashes of light for a few seconds, but when they have this kind of photopsia, I do, and I'll show you why. Do we need to do OCT on these patients? I don't think so. I think OCT is generally useless in these individuals. There are some studies that have tried to see do patients with migraine have thinner retinal nerve fiber? They have some degree of vasculopathic tendency. You know, the migraine causes uh, vasoconstriction or vasodilation, and that that, or actually vasodilation, and that that's going to damage the retinal nerve fiber layer. From a clinical practice standpoint, I don't think it makes any sense to do OCT routinely on these patients. And is there anything else that we need to do in these individuals? Well. I think that we need to remember that we are doctors first and we need to turn on the lights and look at the patient. Is the patient wearing sunglasses? Okay, there are some patients with sunglasses who are, um, and uh, let's see if we can get rid of the green lines on the screen here. Someone's drawing on the screens. So maybe we can get rid of those green lines. But uh, in any case, if a patient has 10 out of 10 pain, that's always a little worrisome to me. Migraine pain can be severe, but it is usually not something that the patient is going to categorize as the worst pain of their life. Um, if a patient is ill appearing and they come in with photopsias, um, an elderly patient who has lost weight um, unintentionally, a patient who I know has cancer, if they are having photopsias, I'm going to be a little more concerned but things that support the idea of having migraine type of aura, photopsias that go along with that, a history of car sickness, a history of sleepwalking as a child. These are factors that support the idea that the patient may just simply have migraine headache and migraine aura. Um, but things that argue against it, transient visual obscurations, makes me think of papilledema, right? It's not gonna make me think of 
migraine aura. And patients with pseudotumor cerebrine papilledema can have photopsias, perhaps because of tugging of the vitreous on the optic disc. Pulse synchronous tinnitus, again, goes along more with pseudotumor. Binocular diplopia, of course, not characteristic of migraine headache, a, a new severe localized headache, and of course, worst headache of my life, a, a headache that is always in the same place, is always a little bit worrisome. And this is, again, just another example of the drawing of those fortification spectra. What is characteristic of migraine aura? It is usually homonymous, although it can fill the whole visual field colored or black and white, expands usually from near fixation, so as shown here, starts in the center and then spreads out in a very characteristic pattern at a very characteristic speed because of cortical spreading depression. And usually lasts at least five minutes. If it's less than five minutes, it's uncharacteristic of migraine aura and should not last more than 60 minutes. If it lasts beyond that, that again makes me worried that this is something else. And not all patients, of course, develop subsequent headache. And this is a map of that cortical spreading depression in the occipital area that you have a start of the depolarization process. And over time, that depolarization spreads from one area in a linear fashion throughout that occipital cortex. And that is the basis for that expansion of the migraine aura as well. It starts in the macular cortex in the posterior pole of the occipital cortex and then spreads anteriorly from there. So this is again the physiologic basis of the uh, reason why uh, people will get the characteristic pattern of their migraine aura. And so I'm trying to find an eraser here quickly to see if I can take out these green lines because oh, I don't have an eraser. Okay, well, never mind. That's okay, we'll have green lines. So, some patients describe, though, a pixelation in their vision that is different from the photopsias of migraine aura. And we have some patients who, after their migraine aura, they will describe that there are these persistent little flashes of light and they eventually remit. But then, I live in Colorado, it's not the time of year where we have snow, but certainly patients will describe this snow in their vision. And I think it is important when we talk about photopsias and we talk about headache, that we talk about the idea of atypical symptoms that have been classified as migraine aura, but aren't really migraine. And what things should make us think about factors that are not quite characteristic. Well, if the symptoms last for less than five minutes, I already mentioned that, that is more likely to be some other process. It could even be a persistent transient visual obscuration. It could be ischemic. It could be a variety of things, but it is less likely to be migraine. Photopsia is without form. So again, because of that characteristic cortical spreading depression, patients usually see a pattern of some sort. They'll see zigzags, they'll see the stars in a pattern, but they usually don't just see bright flashes, blinding flashes of light. That's a little bit different. If they have highly stereotyped symptoms, the photopsias are always in exactly the same place that's a little worrisome as well. When the patient tells me, oh, it worried me because the first time it was on the left side and then the second time it was on the right side, that actually makes me feel a lot better because that's much less likely to be a, a warning sign of a structural lesion, so constant laterality. An absence of headache. Um, no history of migraine, but particularly patients who are older. I get migraine without aura. So I get acephalgic migraine. I will get migraine aura that lasts up to 30 minutes, and then it goes away, and I am blessed, one of those fortunate people who doesn't get the headache afterwards. But it started when I was 23 years old. If it started now, when I'm in my 50s, that would be worrisome. That would be uncharacteristic for migraine aura without headache. And I would stick myself in an MRI scan to make sure there wasn't something else going on. For example, this is a patient who was initially thought to have migraine aura. This was a teenager who was having intermittent formed 
photopsia. So more of a fortification type spectra, but they were always on the same side. They were always on the right side of vision. And of course, Eventually, this patient underwent an MRI scan of the brain, and it showed that there was this malformation, this vascular malformation in the brain that was irritating the adjacent cortex and causing those symptoms. The other thing that comes up that I alluded to when I mentioned, when I put up the picture of the lovely winter landscape, is visual snow. And visual snow has been described by patients as being continuous dots in the vision. So there are certainly people who are listening to this talk who like me, and maybe, I don't know if in South America, you still have times where the TV uh, stations stop broadcasting, but the, they would broadcast this pattern, this static pattern that would appear on the television screen, or this was just the baseline on a cathode ray tube. And patients have described this phenomenon being in their vision. And the visual snow syndrome has been described as this uh, appreciation of continuous dots in the vision with at least two of the four accompanying features. So if a patient comes in and just says, oh, my vision looks pixelated, uh, that's not enough to make a diagnosis of visual snow syndrome. They should have palinopsia, so persistent visual images, or more commonly trailing of images as they look from one thing to another. Enhanced entoptic phenomena, so they may really experience those blue light entoptic phenomena or seeing red blood cells going across the retina. They are perhaps hyper aware of these entoptic phenomena. They may have severe photophobia or they may have conversely nyctalopia. And so some combination of these symptoms along with this characteristic description of visual snow is required. Their symptoms, of course, should not be attributable to typical migraine headache and not attributable to something else like drugs. There are drugs, drugs of abuse, that can also cause patients to have snowy vision and will give them these various symptoms. And so there are a number of different ways in which, again, patients have described their visual snow. Some, like in panel B, it's just, again, a fuzziness to everything. In panel D, a description of the palinopsia or trailing that patients see. These are some of the enhanced and toptic phenomena, seeing floaters or other blood vessel structures projected against a blue background, and some of the other phenomena of the patients. E is, again, visual snow against a background of a blue sky with clouds, and just showing you some of the things that patients have described as being characteristic of their visual snow. Um, is, I don't think it's a variant of migraine aura. I think we're getting more and more data to tell us that it is not because it's constant, it's unformed, and it's throughout the visual field. And in my experience, I have tried to treat some of these patients as though they had status migranosis to give them a bolus of prednisone and taper them quickly over a course of six days. And while it maybe has a little bit of a placebo effect in some patients, I don't think it is truly affecting their disease and truly resulting in a downregulation of this phenomenon. It does tend to be recognized more by young patients. They may say in retrospect, even though they come to see you at age 23 on average, that if they think back even to childhood, they experience these phenomena. Um, but in terms of therapy for these patients or in terms of treatment, um, lamotrigine has been shown to have some benefit and that may be something to offer to these patients. I don't think we understand the mechanism of action for it. And again, just for those of you who have never seen actual snow, you can go on YouTube and if you are really, really bored, you can put this video and loop it over and over again and watch visual snow on your own computer. I don't recommend that you do this on an ongoing basis. Uh, this is a patient 
who came to see me, a 63-year-old man who was having trouble driving at night. He was bumping into objects. He was seeing flashes with his eyes closed. And he was referred to me primarily because he was seeing flashes, because he was having photopsias. And his visual acuity was normal in both eyes. He had slow pupillary reactions, and his visual fields did show generalized constriction. He did not have a cancer history, but he turned out to have cancer-associated retinopathy. So again, he didn't have headaches but this was the photopsias that had been mistaken for a migraine-like phenomenon. He was sent to see me, and only by putting together the picture of visual disturbance, constricted visual fields, and the photopsias did we recognize that he had a paraneoplastic syndrome. He had symptoms before his cancer was found. He was found to have colon cancer that was causing his paraneoplastic syndrome. Cancer-associated retinopathy, an autoimmune process, generally from antibodies uh, to anti-enolase or to um, anti-recovery. And the main way in which we manage these patients is to treat the malignancy. Now, another condition in which photopsias are common, where headache is common because it tends, this condition affects younger patients, but the photopsias have nothing to do with headache, is in this condition here, where this 43-year-old woman who had a history of Lyme disease that had been treated, but otherwise was in excellent health. She had several days of photopsias in her left eye, but she also reported that she had an area of scotoma in her left eye. She um, had acuities of 2020 and 2040. She did have an RAPD in her left eye, which typical migraine photopsias will never give you, of course. And she had an enlarged blind spot in the left eye, a normal visual field in her right eye. And so this, another cause of photopsias, the azor, the occult zonal outer, ret um, excuse me, occult zonal um, outer retinopathy or um, acute enlargement of the blind spot syndrome. These two conditions are a spectrum of disease with photoreceptor dysfunction. That photoreceptor dysfunction can be unilateral or bilateral. We don't know what causes it. The cause remains unknown. There, I'm not convinced that there are any true systemic associations with it, certainly not demyelinating disease. It is thought to fall into the spectrum of other white dot syndromes. And in terms of treatment, the recovery from this is somewhat mixed and the treatment strategy is not clear as to what really results in improvement. And you can see that patients with almost any fun disappearance can have um, acute zonal um, occult to outer retinopathy. Now, remember, this is a talk about headache. And we're going to take a step back to other types of headache, again, for the general ophthalmologist. Here we have a 23-year-old woman who came in for a routine eye exam. She just wanted a glasses update. She saw a different eye doctor last year. She reports that her headaches are late in the day. She has nausea but no vomiting, and she's sensitive to light and sound. She has gained 30 pounds in the past year. And I neglected to mention when I was talking before about the migraine type of photopsias and the mimickers of that, that in general, if a patient has three characteristics of migraine headache, nausea, light or sound sensitivity, difficulty with motion or motion making the headache worse, they have a 90 eight to 99% chance that their headache is migraine. But this patient who had normal acuity, pupils, and motility had no other problem, right? She had optic disc drusen. She had been sent with a diagnosis of papilledema to this ophthalmologist and just had optic disc drusen. But it is also possible that patients like this may present with migraine headache light and sound sensitivity, they may have gained weight recently, and they may have asymptomatic papilledema. So the point I'm trying to make with this is not to confuse you. The point I'm trying to make with this is that this is a very typical presentation for a patient who comes into a general ophthalmologist's office. Woman in her 20s, wants her glasses updated. She says she's never been told that her fun disappearance was abnormal, she has migraine headache, and she has optic disc drusen. But uh, the next patient who walks in the door could very well have papilledema 
which is the importance of paying attention to whether they have other symptoms and then talking to the patient and saying, well, have you ever had transient visual obscurations? Might you have pulse synchronous tinnitus? You have gained weight. Have you taken any other high-risk medicines for pseudotumor cerebri? So in terms of the headache that occurs with papilledema, malignant hypertension always has to be kept in mind, particularly when the optic disc swelling is very severe or is very hemorrhagic in nature, and the patient may or may not have a history of hypertension. I do visual field testing in all of these patients who come in the door because we need to get a baseline for what their optic nerve function might be to correlate if there is any actual vision loss with the severity of the papilledema that they are presenting with. And then they get sent on to get either a CT or an MRI to exclude obstructive hydrocephalus. So this is a three-step approach I recommend to a comprehensive ophthalmologist when seeing a patient in the clinic who you think might have papilledema. Check blood pressure first, do visual fields to look for any defects, and then CT or MRI. What are we looking for on, this, on the CT or the MRI in this particular case? The MRI typically should show no abnormalities within the brain. The ventricles should be of normal size as shown here on this axial MR image. And on sagittal image, we may best appreciate the presence of an empty cell atursica that is a characteristic finding in patients with chronically elevated intracranial pressure. And the arrow helpfully points that out to us here. What the size of the empty cell atursica tells me, this is not really there in the literature, and I don't know that we will ever publish anything systematically on this because we have no way of knowing, but I really feel that this is a sign of chronicity of the ICP elevation because it takes time for the cell to remodel for this space within it to become so large as it is shown here. And tells you that this patient is unlikely to have had chronic or acute papilledema. Excuse me, they would not have acute papilledema. They're more likely to have chronic papilledema. And this gray here just shows you what the normal pituitary would look like if the cella were not empty. Now, we need to make sure the patient doesn't have things like obstructive hydrocephalus with enlargement of the ventricles, a hyperdensity within the sagittal sinuses indicating that this patient could have a venous sinus thrombosis. So these are emergent sorts of events or emergent sorts of conditions that the ophthalmologist has to recognize. And even in the modern era, there will be patients who present with what looks like a typical pseudotumor cerebri syndrome picture. So this was a woman in her 30s who had been having papilledema for a few months. She had been uh, seen, or she'd been having headaches for several months, and then she was seen by an ophthalmologist who recognized that she had bilateral papilledema. She had um, some visual field abnormality. She did have a mild APD in one eye, but she was not really complaining of any vision loss. The uh, patient had a BMI of 43, so she was morbidly obese, and it was thought that she had idiopathic intracranial hypertension. She came from a few hours away from our practice, and so it took several weeks for her to make her way to our clinic. She had not had any neuroimaging. We sent her for urgent MRI and found this very large frontal meningioma that was causing obstructive hydrocephalus and her papilledema. So remember, these patients still show up even today. It's not just something historic that these patients will uh, have not a brain tumor. So it's called pseudotumor cerebri for a reason. So what next? What are we going to look at now in terms of patients with headache? What do we need to keep in mind with headache and eye pain? Here we have the case of a 30-year-old, otherwise healthy woman. She reports she's had blurred vision. Maybe she says, I'm having trouble with depth perception when I'm doing fine motor tasks or when I drive, I'm having some trouble. She's had headaches for years. There's no sudden change in her headache character. She has normal visual acuity, slightly reduced color vision, and now she has a right relative afferent pupillary defect. But 
you do visual field testing on her because she's complaining of difficulty with depth perception and we find some significant abnormalities, right? So she came into the office saying she has depth perception trouble, that she has headache for years, and the headaches along with blurry vision are what prompted her to come in. She does not report having any trouble with her peripheral vision, but yet she has a significant bitemporal hemianopia. Well, how does this figure into the headache side of things? Well, clearly with a bitemporal hemianopia, we want to look in the area of the optic chiasm as shown here in this coronal T2-weighted MRI. And this was her MRI, not surprisingly, where she has a moderately sized supracellar tumor causing chiasmal compression, causing draping of the chiasm, a very chronic compression of the optic chiasm that is leading to her bitemporal hemianopia. So the question that always comes up when we see these patients, and I think this comes up with neuro-ophthalmologists as well as general ophthalmologists who maybe make this diagnosis is, is this tumor the cause of the headache? Is, has this tumor been the cause of the headache all along? And is treating this headache necessary, or is treating this tumor going to result in headache improvement? And I would say that the data on this would support the idea that it is very mixed there are some patients who undergo surgery for a pituitary adenoma who never have a headache again. They say that surgery cured my headache and they never have any difficulty after that. But remember, this patient has had headache for years. This tumor has probably been there for some time, but to, we cannot be certain by any means that this headache is being caused by the tumor. And I typically do not assure the patient that their headache is going to get better when this tumor is removed. Now, one condition in which I think it is very important that we as ophthalmologists recognize that there can be severe headache with pituitary tumor, and this is potentially a life-threatening crisis, can be seen by this ring sign here, which the arrow is pointing to. So you have a supracellar tumor with the central dark area and this rim of it, and this is characteristic of pituitary apoplexy. And that is shown here where we have um, some hypo intensity within the mass of the tumor and an acute compression of the right side of the optic chiasm and the right optic nerve by this sudden expansion of that supracellar tumor. So that sudden expansion causes headache. It may involve the cavernous sinus as well, but doesn't always have to. So diplopia and ortosis may be part of the picture, but headache with this kind of or sudden severe headache and potentially with vision loss is a hallmark of pituitary apoplexy. Acute pituitary apoplexy is a life-threatening condition. And chiasmal compression with field loss is the usual way in which it presents. Optic nerve compression can occur unilaterally, and it is reversible if treated quickly by an experienced neurosurgeon who knows to preserve that vascular plexus underneath the chiasm. Now, subclinical pituitary apoplexy is more common. In other words, if you see a patient who has bitemporal hemianopia and you get an MRI scan, you may find evidence in their uh, scan that there has been intermittent hemorrhage. There may be heterogeneity within the pituitary gland that points to subacute or subclinical pituitary apoplexy. Because two to 12% of tumors undergo apoplexy. However, it's the presenting sign of the pituitary tumor in 50% of cases. When I see a patient who comes to me with, with a pituitary tumor, no history of pituitary apoplexy, but maybe they're referred to me because they have bitemporal hemianopia and a supracellar tumor has been discovered or maybe hasn't been discovered yet, I caution every one of them about pituitary apoplexy because that drop in cortisol that occurs when you get necrosis of the pituitary gland, that sudden drop in cortisol could kill the patient within hours. Prompt recognition of the pituitary apoplexy, though, can result in significant improvement. This is a patient who came to see me who had 
sudden onset of a bitemporal hemianopia, left eye worse than right. She did, uh, she had no relative afferent pupillary defect. Her MRI showed a very large lesion in the supracellar space. She was taken to surgery within 24 hours. And by six months later, you can see that her visual field defect has completely resolved. So timely intervention in patients with pituitary apoplexy can preserve their vision, but also can preserve their life and make sure that this uh, occurs. Pardon me, I am on call. I need to take this call quickly. Pardon me. This is Dr. Subramanian. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, sure, give me one second. Um, let, let me talk to the PA first. I'm going to talk about headache and vision loss. And headache and vision loss can occur, you know, we know that this is a life-threatening emergency, right? An 84-year-old woman, headache over her frontal and temporal areas. She's had two months of weight loss and fatigue, sudden complete vision loss in her left eye with light perception vision 2040. She has a left RAPD, and of course, you can't test her field. Um, I would think that any ophthalmologist is going to recognize this as giant cell arteritis. But headache and double vision also can present as a life-threatening emergency. And those of you who were here when I talked about diplopia previously will know that I showed a case of a woman like this who had mild ptosis of her right upper eyelid. She had a small hypertropia caused by a deficit of extraocular movement, and she had mild anisocoria. And this was a third nerve palsy that presented as headache and double vision, but it was initially just thought to be double vision that was attributable to the fact that the patient was in severe pain. So please be very careful not to make an assessment like that and to think that the patient is just having pain causing double vision. You must think of the fact that the patient could have an aneurysm arising from the post, a junction of the posterior cerebral, posterior communicating artery. Hello? Um, posterior communicating artery aneurysm arriving at the junction of the ICA and the internal carotid artery, compressing the third nerve. This shows you what a uh, surgical view would look like with the optic nerve here. This is, of course, on the right side, not on the left side. This is the internal carotid artery. Here's the aneurysm, and here's the third nerve being compressed by the aneurysm. Aneurysm ruptures, the cause of 5 to 15 percent of stroke worldwide. 20% of all subarachnoid hemorrhage patients die without medical care. Those who reach medical care and are diagnosed with subacute hem uh, so with subarachnoid hemorrhage die from acute causes, and 50% of survivors have severe disability. So we're left with, of 10 patients who maybe start with aneurysm, two of them go on to have a good, normal life. We know that headache and ptosis is another condition where we need to pay more attention. So when a patient comes in to see you in your office and complains of new ptosis in addition to headache, this is a 40-year-old woman who's otherwise healthy. She has episodic headaches on the right side of her head and face. She has severe pain that then remits. She has no visual change, but she has this picture here. So on the right side of her face, Oh, so on the right side, where she gets these episodic headaches and these episodic severe pain on the right side, she has a smaller pupil than on the left. She has a small degree of ptosis compared to the left, and maybe a little bit of lower eyelid elevation, although it's not very obvious. So when I see a patient who presents with headache and purely ptosis, no, ptosis is common, headache is common. So I'm not necessarily going to be thinking that they have a syndrome like this, like a Horner's syndrome as I'm showing here, but 
always keep in mind when you see this persistent anisocoria, smaller pupil on the side of the ptosis, that we have to think of Horner's syndrome. Now, Horner's syndrome certainly is characteristic to occur with the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, or the TACs, as they have been called. And the spectrum of this disease is quite broad. Cluster headache is perhaps the more common form of the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias. Cluster headache is defined by exactly that. Patients get these severe episodes of unilateral head and face pain that come in clusters, and the episodes last for anywhere from 15 to 180 minutes. During that time, they may have some tearing, they may have some injection of the eye because of autonomic dysfunction that goes along with the trigeminal distribution pain. And that autonomic dysfunction may not remit. So when the patient I showed you before who has a Horner syndrome, that may be a sequela of cluster headache. Now cluster headache is more common in men than in women. So when a woman comes in complaining of symptoms that are characteristic of cluster headache, I'm a little more likely to maybe do MR imaging or some other investigation as I'll show you on the next slide. But you can be a hero as an ophthalmologist by making some of these diagnoses because many of these patients are misdiagnosed with migraine headache because migraine headache is common, right? But the response of trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias to migraine therapy is usually quite poor. At least a, a few times a month, I will get a patient like this who comes in, is sent to me because maybe they have some blurred vision, maybe they even have a Horner syndrome and they are being treated for migraine headache, and they are miserable from their headache. You know, these are drawings of how patients have described their pain with trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia. And, but if you recognize that they actually have cluster headache, paroxysmal hemicrania with lancinating pain, different from, uh, this is not trigeminal neuralgia, this is a different kind of pain, it lasts for longer, and hemicrania continua, a constant pain over half of the head, other types of conditions sunk, um, severe unilateral neuralgia form headache with conjunctival tearing. Suna, these variants of the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias will respond, some of them respond to, uh, to oxygen therapy, others respond to anti-seizure medications, and it's very important to make this distinction. But not all patients who have headache and Horner syndrome will have a trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia. And if this 40-year-old otherwise healthy woman came in with new headache and neck pain after a motor vehicle accident and, in, and noticed a mild right upper eyelid ptosis, the patient didn't note anisocoria, but you did on your examination, and the remainder of the exam is normal, you need to be concerned that this patient could have a carotid dissection. This is showing the crescent sign that you see, the um, enhancement with a small preserved lumen, and a narrowing, a loss of signal within the normal internal carotid artery. This dissection compresses those sympathetic fibers coming along the carotid. And this is potentially an emergent condition for which you need to make the diagnosis. So those are the dangerous sorts of things that I want you to be aware of. I'll spend the last several minutes here talking about all these other headaches, right? Migraine headache without aura. Is there anything the ophthalmologist needs to be worried about in patients who have migraine headache without aura? Well, I would say that there's a small group of these patients who get diagnosed with pseudotumor cerebri without papilledema. They may be sent to you as an ophthalmologist to see if they have visual field defects, or they may be sent to the neuro-ophthalmologist with this diagnosis of pseudotumor cerebri without headache. And the advice I give these patients based on my experience and based on the literature is that the ophthalmologist has a limited role in the care of these patients. They almost never lose vision because they don't have papilledema, and papilledema is the reason for vision loss in the setting of pseudotumor cerebri and headache. And migraine headache without aura is not really associated with any ophthalmologic disorder. Sinus headache. I forget if sinus headache is a diagnosis that is frequently made in South America or not. It is a common North American diagnosis. It is 
made because patients often feel head stuffiness. But if these patients get a scan, a CT or an MRI, their sinuses are clear. The pain is trigeminal pain. A migraine headache causes activation of the trigeminal system, but they get labeled with this sinus headache. And I think that's finally falling out of favor in North America. Tension headache. Tension headache, the typical, the kind of headache like I have at the end of the day, right after dealing with the laboratory and dealing, being on call and getting a call and then the uh, physician's assistant who called decided that they not really, didn't really need to see me, so I'm sitting there on hold for three minutes, that gives me a headache, right? So tension headache, band-like tension across the forehead. Does this ever lead to vision issues? Well, eye strain headache can contribute to tension headache. Refractive error, uncorrected refractive error, presbyopia can contribute to tension headache. Presbyopia doesn't cause migraine headache. Presbyopia doesn't cause ptosis. Presbyopia doesn't cause the other things I talked about, but it's generally benign. And then, you know, my kids give me a headache, right? You know, there are all sorts of headaches that are out there. And I think as ophthalmologists, we need to be aware of these different kinds of headaches, but realize that most of them don't really have any visual consequence. I put in a single slide on eye pain. I did not want to go into great detail about eye pain. And why is that? Because I think that from a practical standpoint, eye pain can be considered and managed in a number of different ways. So one of my friends, Mike Lee, gives an hour-long course on eye pain and headache for the ophthalmologist at the AAO. And it's a great course if you attend the AAO, have the opportunity to participate in that, I think you would enjoy it. But this is the short version of how to manage patients who come in with eye pain. I will say as a neuro-ophthalmologist, when I see an eye, patient, eye pain patient on my schedule, my heart sinks a little bit because the majority of patients with eye pain have referred pain, and typically it's headache pain that is referred to the eye, usually migraine headache pain. I don't know about you, but then I spend an um, inordinate amount of time talking to the patient, explaining the trigeminal innervation system, explaining that the innervation of the eye socket is the same as the brain, and that if you have headache, the sensation can be in the eye, on the eye, behind the eye. And I think three quarters of the time they walk out thinking I'm crazy and they don't believe me. So, but that's our job. We have to try to explain to them why they have this eye pain that goes along with their headache because in most cases it is referred pain from headache. They will say have retrobulbar pressure or things like this. It's referred pain from headache. But what specific causes should you investigate in patients who have eye pain? And again, I'm talking about eye pain without vision loss, not eye pain with vision loss, right? Because eye pain with vision loss can be a whole host of things. Optic neuritis in the right age group, even ischemic optic neuropathy in a subset of patients can be painful. And in a series of patients that we are going to be publishing very shortly, we have found that presumed ischemic optic neuropathy in patients of the age where NAION is characteristic but who have pain may in some cases have a MOG-associated optic neuropathy. So interesting things we're learning about that. But again, eye pain without vision loss. Exposure keratopathy. You already probably know how frequently it is that exposure keratopathy as a source of eye pain is overlooked by general physicians, by optometrists, and even some comprehensive ophthalmologists, unfortunately. I, any patient who gets to me with eye pain, they get a drop of preparacaine in the eye as one of the first steps for me to try to figure out if they have surface disease and if that's the cause of their eye pain. I get a number of patients referred to me for possible trochleitis, and only a small subset of them will have that disorder. So trochleitis is a very specific diagnosis. You get make it, and I don't know, if, you know how many of you can see my video, but you make it by really just pushing in the area of the trochlea. And the patient says, ow, 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 stop that. Because, and it's going to be almost always unilateral. I have never seen a patient with bilateral trochleitis. Trochleitis, a variant of orbital inflammatory disease. 
eye pain without other findings can be a presenting symptom of thyroid eye disease. So I always keep that in the back of my mind because in the early stages of the inflammation, the patient may just have retrobulbar pressure. And it's important to look for other potential signs of thyroid eye disease that can help you to make that diagnosis. The pain of orbital inflammation is usually quite severe, but the patient may have no other external signs. We think that a patient with eye pain in orbital inflammatory disease should have something else, right? They classically have a red eye, or they have periocular swelling, or they have swollen lacrimal gland, or they have proptosis. But if they have isolated myositis, for example, they may just have pain. They may not even have double vision, but they may have intense pain. So we have to keep that in our differential diagnosis. Greater occipital neuralgia is underdiagnosed, and if you make this diagnosis, especially as an ophthalmologist, you will be a hero. Your patients will love you because these are patients who have gone from doctor to doctor to doctor trying to figure out why they have eye pain. And they will have constant or intermittent eye pain, that but it never goes away completely. It, it gets worse and better, but it never goes away completely. And if you do a simple examination maneuver where you press on the area adjacent to the greater occipital tubercle, where the greater occipital nerve runs, and the patient will jump out of the chair in pain because you will have made their pain, you will have made a diagnosis and you will have temporarily made their pain very severe by pressing. So that's the diagnostic maneuver to understand and recognize greater occipital neuralgia, and the patient will love you forever because this is a treatable cause of eye pain. They can get injections of lidocaine and or steroid into that area to quiet down that inflammation of the greater occipital nerve. What's being recognized now more and more is neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain resulting either from chronic migraine, resulting from chronic exposure keratopathy, and those trigeminal nerves just fire, 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 keep firing, and the patient unfortunately has persistent pain that doesn't respond to headache therapy. It doesn't respond to topical anesthetics, but it may respond to drugs drugs that treat neuropathic pain, drugs like gabapentin or pregabalin. So again, making a diagnosis of neuropathic pain can be very helpful. I have a patient who I'm going to be treating in the near future who has such severe neuropathic pain in his right eye that he is suicidal. And he first came to see me asking me to take his eye out. He's 20-20 in that eye, but he wanted his eye out. I convinced him that taking his eye out wouldn't actually fix his pain because his eye pain is coming from neuropathic pain and neuropathic involvement of his supraorbital and supratrochlear nerves. I gave him diagnostic injections of those nerves. His pain temporarily went away. I'm going to go in and surgically cut his supraorbital and supratrochlear nerves with the hope that doing so will cut off transmission of that neuropathic process. It's going to give him some numbness on his forehead, but I'm hopeful that that will help him. Neuroimaging is not really helpful in patients who have isolated eye pain with no vision loss, no other findings. This has been demonstrated in studies in the literature and holds out in my experience as well. And I already spoke about some of the diagnostic tests that I like to use in these patients with eye pain. <clears throat> so I'll be happy to take any questions now, but remember headache is common. You wanna look for the associated symptoms of nausea, light sensitivity, aura, a motion sensitivity that help you to make a diagnosis of migraine headache with 99% certainty in patients who present with characteristic photopsias. But remember that atypical photopsias need to be worked up further. They should not be attributed to migraine. Papilledema we know needs to be evaluated urgently and we need to be alert for warning signs with headache, diplopia, anisocoria, or ptosis that tell us that the patient has some other disorder. So again, thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Well, we have to check. Uh, tell them that it's nice to hear you. Um, we have, let me check if they have. Uh, in the middle, line, how did you treat the patient with a, a snow visual syndrome? With visual snow syndrome, I will um, often try Lamotrigine. So uh, that, I think, is the one drug that has been suggested to, um, to be beneficial. 
Okay, okay. Uh, Roberto, Edna say, always amazing, by Suna and Son. How do you treat them? Yeah, so the, the patients who have Suna or Sunk, I have tried treating some of them with the um, TCAs, with the amitriptyline or drugs like this. Um, I often send them, I'm very fortunate that I have a really, really fantastic headache clinic here at the university. So I do tend to refer those patients to the headache clinic for a more definitive uh, treatment up there uh, of those conditions. Okay, let me see if they have more, I think. I don't, um, somebody have a question? Excellent talk. Uh, thank you so much. And let me see. Always oh, amazing. Excellent. Nice to hear. I think. Yeah. I don't know if somebody has a question. You want somebody want to do a question? And I'll just okay. mention that um, Indison with Sunk syndrome. Once in a while, you give them Indison, and they immediately have relief. So. Yep. Keep endocin, endomethacin in mind for sunk syndrome. Um, sometimes it makes a huge difference. No, that's good to know, Tom. I, I, you know, probably like you, I tend to, of course, use it in hemicrania continua, but that is uh, good to know with, uh, with sunk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I don't know if you have some question. Somebody may confuse me. Um, Congratulations for you for my private message. Probably they confuse my. <laughs> okay. Um, I, let me check in Facebook. We don't have questions. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Hasta mañana. Gracias a todos.